Good evening. Welcome to the International Spy Museum. I'm Amanda Olke, Director of Adult Education here at the museum. We're delighted to have you with us for In True Face with Jana Highstand Mendez and Liza Mundy. We're so glad to host Jana as she launches her new book in which she tells her own story in her own words at last. Jana is a founding board member of the Spy Museum, and the knowledge and background she accrued in her epic career at the CIA is really embedded in the DNA of this place. It is a pleasure and a privilege to have her here with us for this meeting of her fan club. <laughs> But her interviewer is no slouch either. <laughs> Liza Mundy is the best-selling author of The Sisterhood, The Secret History of Women at the CIA. Guess who's included in that wonderful read, which came out last fall. She is also the author of four other books, including Code Girls. Liza is a former staff writer for The Washington Post who writes for many publications including The Atlantic, Politico, and Smithsonian. Thanks so much. Now over to you, Liza and Jana. Thank you so much uh, for having us. Uh, it's an honor to be on the stage with the legendary Jana Mendez, uh, who among many other things, you were so helpful to me when I was writing my own book, and I so appreciate that, and I'm thrilled uh, to be talking to you about this wonderful book. And happy Pub Day, because today is the um, official publication day of In True Face. So big deal. That's a big deal, yes, yes. And Jana, as an extra treat, has uh, put together a slideshow of some of the great photos that are in the book uh, that are, are we're going to weave our conversation in and out with the photos and, and merge it all together. And, and each photo is better than the other, or they're just, they're just all wonderful. So I wonder if we could start, actually, um, could you talk a little bit about the title of the book? Because it's such a great title. And I remember when I was reporting The Sisterhood, you hear the phrase true name, somebody's true name. And as with all kinds of jargon in terms of art, it took me a little while to figure out what that meant exactly. And I had never come across the expression in true face. But I wonder, is that a term of art? Like, is that a common term at the agency? It, it, it's just, it's so evocative of what you're doing in the book. In the disguise labs, it's a right. very it's a very true uh, uh, term that we use. You come into our disguise labs. Uh, if you're a woman, you take off your makeup. If you're a man, y there you are. But you are in true face. <laughs> <laughs> in true face is before we start fixing it or changing it or fiddling with the way you look. But in true face is the real the real you. Um, and so when I picked the name, I wondered if people would understand what it meant. I mean, to me, it was an obvious name. So I tested it on a number of people. And even people that didn't know what it meant thought it was a good name. So we, we, we stuck with it. Um, yeah. It, oh. But it comes out of the disguise labs. Oh, I think it's just wonderful. And, it, and it, it evokes like coming out of the shadows or, you know, presenting your real self, exposing yourself to vulnerability. Because as you talk about and as we will talk about, disguises, among other things, are a form of protection. Absolutely. And when you... And when you create disguises, you are protecting people and ensuring their safety. I remember you made that point to me uh, in, in our conversation, and, and I, I thought about it a lot. Um, so I, I just think it's, it's the ideal uh, title for almost any memoir in which someone's being honest, but yours uh, above all. So congratulations on that, because titles are hard. Uh, and so, so if we could talk about let's let's begin by talking about your introduction to your career, your your background, uh, and this photo. If you could talk about why what what's what's happening. Well, in that photo, I think I'm 20. I had just left Wichita, Kansas, to go to Europe, to go to Germany, and be in my best friend's wedding. I was her uh, maid of honor. She got married in a village in Germany. She was uh, marrying an American military second lieutenant. If you're not military oriented, that's the, the most junior officer you can be. There's nothing, I don't think, below second lieutenant <laughs> <laughs> at all. Um, it was a tank battalion, and, and uh, it was, I thought it was very exotic. But coming from Kansas, 
into the hills and forests of Germany where everything was deep shades of green and the hills were rolling and it was lush and it was, uh, it was just beautiful. And I came from the part of Kansas where it's flat as a board, where it's nothing but corn and silos. You know, you, you direct people by it. You go until you see the silo on your right and then you turn left. And uh, it was just, it was a dramatic difference. Um, now in this picture, we're drinking um, German beer. And that also played a small role in my, my love of the country. Uh, in Kansas, you had to be 21 to order a 3.2 beer. The fact was you could never drink enough of that beer to even get a buzz going. <laughs> and when you're, when you're in your late teens and early 20s, I mean, that's a significant piece of information. Uh, in Germany, they didn't care that I was 21. I turned 21 there. They would have poured me a beer if I was five years old in a cafe, and people did. Their children drank beer. I liked the people. I liked the language. It was uh, in the late 60s, there, were still, there was evidence of World War II all over the place. They had not yet fixed Germany, so there were bullet holes in the buildings. The opera house had lost its, its whole top floor, and there was a tree growing out of it. Uh, young man I started dating, uh, his apartment, everywhere there was a, a cabinet with a, with a sliding, closing catch. They were all ripped off. There were bullet holes inside. I mean, you were just always aware that there had been this, this war and, and that they were still recovering from a war. There were way more women on the street than men, but no women wearing pantsuits, just to put a pin on how mm -hmm. long ago this was. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I was there, I, I, uh, my, my friends got married, they, they left, they went to Italy on a honeymoon, took a train, and there I was in this little village, um, and I just decided I didn't want to go home to Wichita, Kansas. I wanted to stay, and I couldn't really figure out how. What I did was I took a train to Frankfurt. Frankfurt's a big banking capital, it was and is, it's a center of economic activity. And so is Germany a center of economic activity. So I, got a, um, I went to the Bahnhof, I got a big um, telephone book, there was a, a phone booth, I got a handful of uh, Deutsche Marks. The phone book was in alphabetic order and I started calling American banks alphabetically. Well, first I called the American consulate, they said we don't do jobs here, we do visas. <laughs> I called American Express, no job. I called Bank of America, no job. I called, I, I don't remember the third one, but the fourth one was Chase Manhattan Bank which was, um, today it's not Chase Manhattan, today it's J.P. Morgan Chase, I think is what it's called. I actually addressed a group of J.P. Morgan Chase here in this museum about three months ago and thanked them for jump-starting my career <laughs> in the CIA. They never really quite figured it out. So I'm on the phone in the train station in a phone booth. Hello, I'm, I'm American, I'm here, and I'm looking for a job. And the obvious questions, they said, have you worked in a bank? No. Did I speak German? No. Did I have a work permit, which is a requirement? No. And they said, why don't you come down and talk to us? <laughs> this happened more than once in my career where I, I think luck was stalking me always. So I went and talked to them and they, they, they hired me. And then they found out that um, I couldn't really do numbers uh, so well. <laughs> That was not, we didn't get into that in the, in the uh, initial part of the conversations. So I ended up working for the president of the bank doing his English correspondence, and I got to stay in Europe, and uh, there we were. This was part of staying in Europe. Uh, we traveled everywhere, we went to wine festivals. There was a group of young Americans, men, who uh, I thought were military, because there was a huge American presence there, mm -hmm. military. Um, but they weren't, they were civilians. And one in particular was very, very charming and really a lot of fun. And um, he spoke fluent German, and uh, I started dating him. And um, that would become my first husband, actually, that, that first young man that I met in the lobby of Chase Bank. But it was, there was a lot of happenstance going on there. There was a lot of just breaking away. And I discovered, this, this repeats in my career, where I keep rounding a corner and taking, taking an unlikely turn. I don't know that I'm recommending that as a career path. <laughs> it worked for me, um, but that was the beginning of, of being in Germany and staying in Germany. Well, that's wonderful. What had you envisioned for yourself? First of all, this was your first trip abroad, I would think. Absol absolutely. Yeah. I didn't know anybody who had yeah. been to Europe. Yeah, so what, what had you thought 
how had you thought your life was going to unfold before you took this fateful trip abroad? I was, uh, I was in school. I was in college, Wichita State University right. in Wichita. I was working as a secretary to pay my own tuition. I was yeah. paying my way through school. And um, uh, school was getting harder. <laughs> the, I, was, I was taking a, what was it? It was a logic course the semester that I, that was my last semester. And I was really happy to step away from that. But, but um, <laughs> I don't know that I, I didn't have a road map. I think I was just interested to see what else was out there besides corn and cattle and a little bit of oil and Boeing and Beach and Cessna and Learjet mm -hmm. because my, my town, Wichita, that was the airplane capital of the world. Right, and, and we're going to talk about that because uh, I'm interested in talking about your mother mm. and what you learned from your mother, both yeah. in terms of technical ability that you know may or may not have been inherited or learned or whatever, but also her experience in the workplace. There was, there was one more small piece about leaving like I did. Um, and staying. I had, I had a sister, an older sister, who was 15 months older than me. We were very close age-wise. And she was brilliant. And she was blonde. And she was beautiful. She was funny and so smart. We loved her more than we loved anybody else. But I, I grew up in her shadow. Mm. I grew up trying to measure up to that. I don't know. And I, I had always kind of wondered, what if I didn't have Cinderella over here as my sister? Then what would my life be like? And that was part of stepping away to see, could I even function out there on my own? I was known as Jennifer's little sister for a long time. But and maybe that made you more comfortable than with a sort of a clandestine life, you know, not being in the spotlight. Um, that that's just a, a thought that I throw out as well as thought. the thoughts that occur to me when you speak of luck uh, that you're 21 and you're coming from the heartland of the United States never having been abroad and you land in your Germany and you're like I want to stay here and and then and then that you have the so the adventurousness to do to, to do that and then the tenacity and practicality to get a phone book everybody here knows what a phone book was <laughs> right <laughs> plant-based information storage system uh, <laughs> that reporters uh, also, I mean, like that is, that's, that's the sort of procedural work that every reporter does that I'm sure every detective does. And you just intuited how to do it. So it seems to me that the seeds of, of who you were going to become a lot of the, the hard work and practical tenacity combined with the adventurousness. Oh, I want to stay here. So let me figure out how to do it. Do you, do you want to advance to the next slide and then I'll find a way to um, talk about your mom. <laughs> yeah, so let's talk about what's going on here. This is, this is John Gazer, my first husband. We're in Switzerland, and we would just gotten married. Uh, unlike all my friends back home in Wichita who are having these gigantic weddings and working with caterers and bands and bridesmaids' dresses and all, we went to Switzerland, which was kind of the Las Vegas of Europe. Huh. Because from a paperwork point of view, you could just go down there and, and, and get some translations and a couple of stamps and be married. His parents came. They lived in Vienna, Austria. They were American. He worked at the embassy, though. He had, John had grown up overseas. Uh, his dad worked in a lot of different embassies. And he, spoke, uh, he spoke great German, really good German. He spoke Swiss German and Hochdeutsch, German-German. Uh, he had learned to ski in... Um, in grade school, because in Switzerland, where he went to school, that was the afternoon program with skiing. Morning was math and, you know, vocabulary, <laughs> and afternoon was skiing. He was a great tennis player. He was just really a fun guy, and he knew his way around. I thought he was so sophisticated. He was, and and, and that's this is in uh, this is in Bern, Switzerland. And how much time has passed since you landed in Germany, and now you're married? And a year and, and a half. Yeah, I moved fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let's talk now about becoming a wife and learning what your husband oh. really does. Yeah. And then if we could talk about the term contract wife and what that, what that meant. And, and, and so many people wanted to lose that term, contract wife. And I said, you can't lose it. It's, it's part of the fabric of this story. It's, it's, it's as bad as it sounds. It's, it's, uh, you can't tell the story without talking about the contract wives. When we got married, um, well, I liked being married very much. We traveled, we went everywhere, we saw everything. We were at a wine festival every weekend. We were in Paris or we were in, uh, Paris was 
everything was a day away from Frankfurt. You could be wow. anywhere. You could be in Italy. You could, you could be in uh, Holland. You could be anywhere. And we did that. Um, but then I, then I started working. I started working for the CIA as his wife because he told me about three days before we got married that he wasn't actually a Department of Army civilian. He worked for the CIA. He told me after I had decided to marry him, which I thought was interesting. Uh, yeah. he, he was not a risk taker, uh, that's true. But um, because I was the wife overseas of a CIA officer, I could be hired as a, as a contract person, as a contract wife. There were no contract husbands, it was just contract wives. And what they wanted <laughs> was like a little woman to type and to file and to do all of that secretarial stuff. They wanted secretaries overseas. And so they'd bring the wives in to do that work. And I was happy to do it. Um, so you get a look at the CIA from the inside. Um, it was more looking at logistics. We had, a, we had an around the world flight, for instance, and Frankfurt was a big piece of it. Uh, it was like DHL before DHL. It was like FedEx before FedEx. It was picking up and dropping off things that people needed, either sent home, needed to come out, whatever, an around the world flight. Um, so I did the manifest. It was, it was logistics work. It wasn't particularly operation. It wasn't particularly interesting work. But I met everybody. And here's, here's where this big divide starts happening. And you don't realize it uh, at the moment. But you are severing, when you, when you join, when you are issued a pseudonym. So all the paperwork that said I ever worked there in my life is not in my name. If you could just go to CIA building and go into the archives and say, we know she worked here, we'll find some paperwork. There's no indication that Jonna Mendez or Jonna Gazer ever worked at CIA. Everything is done in pseudonym, everything is done undercover. Um, when you start understanding how it all works, how it all fits together, it starts making sense. But you have become an insider and everybody else <laughs> is an outsider. That means all your neighbors, and you have to explain to your neighbors why your house is different than theirs. This is in a military sense where, where well, the, the, the major, he has, a, he has this kind of washer and dryer, and you have this one, it's better. Why, why is that? This military thing. And it's the thing, other wives who are asking It was them. the wives. Yeah. They were so dangerous. They were like, well, where do, you, where do you go? Why do you have these curtains? Yeah, yeah. They were, where'd you get the curtains? Quartermaster doesn't give us those curtains. So you're always dancing around like on hot coals. But you really, uh, my good friends back home, I couldn't really tell them very often where I was in, in our whole career. Um, couldn't explain why we traveled so much. So you, 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 uh, the insiders and outsiders, it's a chasm, and it cuts you off from a lot of your old, old friends. My sisters, who never lost track of their old friends, today are in touch with people they went to school with, grade school. I lost everybody. I kind of let it happen. I'm not really good at staying in touch anyway, but it was pronounced in my situation. When your uh, husband-to-be revealed to you that he worked for the CIA, that's kind of a big deal. That's a big moment. And uh, w were you surprised? And did you know what the CIA was? And, and what did you think of it? Such what did good you questions. I, I was surprised. I had no reason to think he was anything other than how he presented himself as a civilian working for the Army. Um, I didn't know that much about the CIA. I'm from Wichita, Kansas. Um, I, I, I was assured by him. He said it's honorable work. It's work, work worth doing. It is a profession. I intend to spend my life doing this work. I think if you come in and take a look, you'll understand and you'll appreciate the value that, that CIA adds to the, to the U.S. government. And so I was very accepting. I had no reason or I had no reason whatsoever to challenge anything that he said. And it, throughout my career, I never did challenge what he said because I, I agreed with him. It was, it was uh, I am proud to have spent my life and did you that. Yes. And did you realize at that point that you were going to be entering a clandestine life, what you, what you described, that you were going to have a cover, either going to have a pseudonym, uh, this is a, 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 a world that you're going to be living in, or did that, did it sort of unfold? It unfolds yeah. because you can't, you can't imagine the, the layers of it and the, the, the situations you get yourself in. I know, um, uh, Tony Mendez, when I was married to him, he said, you know what I used to worry about? He said, I used to worry about being out in the field 
and somebody's shooting me, but I'm an alias. I'm not in my true name. My, my everything, my passport, my airline ticket, everything is going to be this other guy. But they're going to kill me. And like, what does that do to the insurance? <laughs> <laughs> um, just these odd situations. And I kept having situations in my career. One of them, I'm swimming, and I'm, 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 I'm not a strong swimmer. And I was in one of those undertows, and I could feel myself being pulled, pulled, pulled. And there was no one with me. And there was no one who knew where I was. Yeah. I had flown on a plane, wow. but I wasn't on the manifest. Uh, and I thought, if this is it, they'll, they'll never know what happened to me. That happened a couple of three or four times when I was worried that I was going to die and no one would know what had happened to me. Wow. Because that, of those cover yeah. scenarios. Yeah. Do you want to advance it to the next, to the next slide and we'll work it in? Oh. That's I was great. a dancer. No, I These was. These are such great photos. <laughs> uh, uh, what what's going on here? What's what's going on is this is our first trip back from Europe, and somehow I'm not sure how we ended up on the SS United States, mm. which was the fastest, most oh, luxurious ship in the world at the time. It was just something. Uh, John had gone back and forth numerous times with his parents because they were always in Europe. I'm from Kansas, right? I'd never seen that much water in my life. Um, <laughs> It was really fun, but John didn't dance, and that was one of the things when we got married. By the way, he said, I don't, and I won't. So this is the dance instructor, and I were dancing on the ship. It was a contest. I won. We won, but it was the dance <laughs> instructor, so I, you know, what can I say? Um, it was memorable going back on that ship, and we went back first class. So we had to come up with a story for how, how did we have the money to go first class. It was a much older crowd and, and wealthy people, and there we were. So John came up with a story that he was a DJ from Hollywood, a really, really famous rock and roll DJ. Of course, they wouldn't have known about him, and that was the story he presented on that cruise. And what I love about that anecdote that will play out in, in the rest of your book and so many fascinating anecdotes is the way that you have to improvise on the fly. Uh, yeah. in that situation. Oh, what is our cover going to be? Because we're in the first class luxurious cabin and how, how would that be plausible? Yeah. And how, and how uh, easily it, I don't, I don't know how easily it came to him to make up the DJ. Um, but you had a, what was your cover or your past? Or you, you were the wife of, you were uh, the DJ's wife? Um, in, in that instance, I was his wife. I had no role other than to yeah. try and look pretty and dance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I worked very hard at that. <laughs> All right. Well, you, you certainly succeeded you. Uh, uh, based on the photo. So you, you talk in the book about how even with your fairly limited workforce experience, because you're just in your early to mid-20s, when, when you become a contract wife for the CIA, you do have some workforce experience. And you say uh, that, it even, that it becomes apparent to you that, um, that it felt like a demotion. That, that moving from the job you had had in the bank to what you're now doing at the agency felt like a demotion. And could you talk a little bit about that and what you mean by that? I, I had done a really good job at the bank, and there was a period of time between the bank and when I got married um, that I worked at the 97th General Hospital. It was a big military hospital, and I had worked at a hospital back in Wichita. That was the secretarial work I was doing, putting myself through school. So... In Frankfurt, in Germany, I was supervising 20 secretaries uh, on the surgical side of the hospital. So I'm 21. I've got all these secretaries working for me, and they're from everywhere. They were from Poland. One was from Australia, a bunch of Germans, some, some French. The only thing that we all had in common was we could speak English, some of them to varying degrees. And we were all doing medical transcriptions of doctors who were from India, who were from China, who were from, and they, the only thing they had in common was they too were speaking English, sort of. So I have to tell you, I, that almost became my first book. I used to take the, 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 dictated, the dictated surgical procedures and then the typed up transcript, and you couldn't tell if they were taking out someone's appendix or their tonsils. And I thought, this is medical mayhem. I mean, someone's going to die or get sued or something because it was actually, it was really 
funny, except that it was, it was serious. So I was supervising that, that group of uh, secretaries. And then at CIA, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in charge of what's on and off of an airplane that's going around the world. And I thought, I can do a lot more than this. You know, but I was actually happy to be working and to be inside the agency in, in whatever capacity at the, at the beginning. And you say in your book that pretty soon into your uh, sojourn in Europe, you start experimenting with photography. Yeah. You pick up a camera and you, and you uh, want to record this beautiful world that you're now living in Germany, et cetera. And that, w w what do you make of that, like looking back? Because uh, not everybody reacts that way. Not, I mean, you clearly have technical abilities that start to manifest themselves right away. Interest in technology. Always. Um, the cameras that I was using in Germany, the, the CIA station had, a, had a, a room full of cameras, and I, I started borrowing them. And some of them were the old cameras up on a tripod, uh, speed graphic cameras where you put a cloth over your head, you're using glass plates, and it was, it was uh, fun to use those. But in Germany, when you walked out the door with all of that equipment, you couldn't like put it in a backpack. You're hauling the tripod, the camera's huge, everything's huge. And in Germany, it worked like a uniform. People would open doors for you simply because you showed up with uh -huh. this huge camera uh -huh. and all the paraphernalia. Uh -huh. It became almost a calling card. Yeah. So there were, there, were, there were, we were close to the Rhine River and there were these wonderful vineyards close to Eberbach or, or uh, Schloss Johannesburg. And we would go down in the cellars, John with his German, me with my camera, and they didn't know who we were, but they were going to let us in when they wouldn't let a lot of tourists in. Mm -hmm. It became a, a key to a, a, an entry point to a portal in Germany that who knew oh, it was there. that's fascinating. Yeah. So could you then talk about, and just advance the slides whenever you want to, uh, uh, talk about then how this, your interests and, and abilities in, in camera technology then played into your, uh, your progress in the agency, your move uh, you know, beyond secretarial work. And you folded in somehow with a pickup truck photo. This is my sister's. We went back to Kansas yeah. briefly uh, for, a, for a home tour after, after Germany. And uh, we're in my dad's truck out in front of the house. And it was just, it was just the, the whole point of that it's picture. It's wonderful. My sisters fell in love with my husband. They just thought, oh, he was, you know, he was. He was a great guy. Um, they, they really liked my, my, uh, my husband, John Gazer. And um, it's just a fun picture of, of, of visiting with my sisters. The idea about technology, um, as, we, as we kept working, there was always this group at every station. There was a technical group. And, and we, we used to say, kiddingly, but it, we weren't kidding at all, that we were Q. We were the Q uh, of CIA, just like in the Bond movies, they have a Q. It's what we did. We did technical support in any medium you can think of, in any manner you could imagine. And then in a whole lot of ways that haven't occurred to you because you haven't had reason to think about it. We could do almost anything. We could build almost anything. We, we were typically way ahead of commercial technology. This changed during my career where commercial technology got ahead of us and we, as far as I know, never caught up. But when I was working there, we, we, were, we were working with ideas and processes that weren't commercially viable yet. So it was fascinating to see how, how, um, how many ways uh, things can be twisted around. I, I was sitting at my desk one day, and there was a, I was sitting for the chief of station secretary, and there was a sofa, and this man came in and sat down. I didn't know who he was. Um, I said, you have an appointment? He said, yes. So he sat there. I did my work. Uh, eventually, he got up, and he just left. He was an African-American man. And I thought to myself, we don't have any African-Americans working here, and he didn't have on a badge. I wonder who that was. Is that a new person that I don't know? So I, I set out to find out who was the African-American man. Well, it was my way future husband, Tony Mendez, in another life that I couldn't imagine when I was older than I ever thought I would be. But it was Tony Mendez wearing a mask and gloves that he was experimenting just inside the office just to see to how it played. Did people look at him funny? Did they, did they uh, notice it? Well, we did not. Uh, and, and so he was always trying to take disguised technology forward. That's, um, that's wonderful. St stuff, stuff like that. There was always stuff going on. 
but because of that, I always had my eye on that group of people, and they worked behind the door in the back, back part of the station. You couldn't really go in there, but I always had thought that would be an interesting place to work. And the, this is a group of male technicians. They're all men. Absolutely. They have degrees from um, co colleges where they got technical skill in Kodak. And so just talk about what it was like to uh, enter into a workforce like that. Tony was the odd man out. Tony did not have a college degree, but they hired Tony as a counterfeiter forger. And his college degree was the fact that he was a successful fine art painter. Mm -hmm. And that was the bona fides that they mm -hmm. needed to see. He did some, some boards for them to look at, Chinese calligraphy, Bulgarian postage stamps. He could, he could just make anything. Um, yeah, but, but typically our technical people came in with, they, w they were degreed, they were all degreed. And the areas that I was interested in speaking and in, in, in working in would want uh, a degree without even a thought they would want a degree. And so how did you make your way in this work culture? Um, I started working in photography when we came back to the States because you, you do a two-year tour and then you typically come home and you go out somewhere else the next time. Uh, we were back in the States. I was working for the director of the office as a secretary. I told him I thought I was going to leave. I was going to go to work for the Smithsonian. Because from my, from my office, across the street from State Department, you could see the turrets of the Smithsonian Castle Building. And I thought there must be some wonderful job there. And I said, you know, I'm thinking of just going and talking to them. And he said, don't do that. Go talk to our people in training. Go take some, go take some photo courses. This is part of that luck. I, I told you it stalked me. This was luck. So uh, the next day, the next, oh, not the great. next day, the next week, I'm up in an airplane. Um, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> yep. I'm up in an airplane. I'm in a harness. They took the doors off. It's just me and the pilot. They gave me a huge, long, long lens, about 300 millimeter lens, old school film camera. And it was called Airborne Platforms. And it was to see if you could resolve the traffic lights, the, the radar tower, the, the geese flying over there to see if you could pick out the license plate on that pickup truck going 60 miles an hour down a dusty road. Could you do that? Uh, and I thought, at the time, I said, that's the most fun I ever had, ever, <laughs> at all. And I said, I thought, if, if this could be my career doing photography, I, I would uh, never go talk to the Smithsonian. And that, that kicked me off on a series of serious training uh, uh, lessons they, they train at CIA, if, if you're not working on an operation, you're in training somewhere, getting ready to work on an operation. But I just loved photography. And I ended up, after all of that, back in Europe, but now I'm working in a photo uh, lab. I'm working in the dark rooms. Um, I'm working with all kinds of cameras. We're putting cameras in. What were we not putting cameras in? You could put a camera in a button. You could put a camera in a briefcase. You could put it in a woman's purse. You could put it in her bra. You could put it in your tie. You could put it in your glasses. You could put it in a fountain pen. We did that a lot. We would have a, we would have a, a film camera in something like this. I think we have one. Do we have one? There it is. But in, inside of the pen is a camera. And inside of the camera, the camera would be like that big. Inside of the camera, is a, a film cartridge, just like the Kodak yellow and black thing, only, and inside the cartridge is a piece of film that's about that long. And on that piece of film, you could take 100 pictures. And then my job was to, um, well, was to load the film, and then when it came back, to develop it and print it on, on you know, really unique equipment that we used. It was, um, mind-numbingly scary to develop that film because the people we gave those cameras to, not just anybody, the person that would get that camera would be someone that could get into Putin's office and get up to his desk, maybe in a conversation, and be in the inner circle, and maybe on the desk are the agendas or the minutes of the meetings. And if Putin turns his head or steps out or gets a conversation going over here, our guy can silently, with one finger, take a picture of a document. And um, if you remember, 
that the purpose of intelligence is to collect the plans and intentions of our enemies. You want to know not what, not what they're doing now. Think about Ukraine. You think about what are they going to do. Think about North Korea's nuclear program. What are they going to do? What is, what, where are the power centers and what's going on? We're trying to bring that kind of intelligence back to our policymakers. That's the only reason the CIA exists. And you know, the CIA was formed out of Pearl Harbor when we had the information from this place and this place and this place, and there was no central point for it all to fuse together so some analysts could say, my God, they're going to attack us. Um, it was born out of huge failure. Uh, this museum has a wonderful exhibit that that points that out very clearly. And what you also document in the book is that you do get hazed by your, uh, it, it's one of, a, a number of hazing incidents in the book uh, by your male colleagues and, uh, and you pass the hazing tests with flying colors. Uh, and you also talk in this section about uh, how there, and talk about that if you want, the, the hazing part, but also this stereotypical thinking that um, a woman can't do this technical work, uh, but also that a woman won't be taken seriously by the people she's training, because part of your job, and getting back to this idea of keeping people safe, is to train the person who's going to be entering Putin's office or the equivalent to use that technology accurately and stay safe and not get caught. Yeah. So can, can you talk about maybe the hazing part, the, when they were testing you, or, uh, and, then, uh, and then how you also showed them that you would be taken seriously uh, when you're training f foreigners? Yeah, uh, the, 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 the hazing, um, I hesitated to put it in the book. I didn't want this book to come off as a, 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 a feminist rant of some sort. And it doesn't. But there were, there were clear moments throughout my career where, where I was, I was um, I was in a situation with a bunch of men, and I was always kind of trying to be like the men, but I wasn't a man. Uh, there would be moments, uh, there was one episode, I went to a movie theater and saw a terrible movie, and I was afraid to leave that movie because the men I was with, who I worked with, uh, would go back and tell all the men in my office that, you know, that I stormed out of a, a movie that I thought was inappropriate. Um, I, had a, I had a boss who, who was just, I had one boss who was horrible. He was difficult to work with. He didn't want me to stay there. He wanted to send me home. He wanted to bring out a, a man, an, a man to do the job he thought needed doing. And uh, we went back and forth and back and forth. When I wrote this book uh, and had sent it into the publisher, and they have lawyers, the lawyers go through your book to make sure you're not going to start any, any any bad court scenes. And they said is that man still alive? And I said, no, no, actually he died. And they were like, okay. <laughs> you can say anything, yeah. <laughs> You're good. Yeah. But the story I told about him and, and how he, he was trying to um, trip me up, it's hazing, it's whatever, but he was setting me up multiple times for real serious failure. And the failure that I would have had would have been a failure involving the people that were supporting us operationally. It would have... You know, it had all kinds of ramifications. I couldn't believe that he would do that. Yeah, and the small incident, smaller incident I was talking about was the one where they give you the role of film that is so difficult to oh. develop, oh, thinking yeah. that surely you'll fail. When I first went into the, when I first went into the, uh, the photo labs, it's all men, and uh, one of them handed me uh, a roll of film and uh, a Nikkor reel. Now, this is back in the day, but you have to take the film out of the cartridge in the dark, and you have to wind it onto this Nikkor reel uh, you drop that into a steel canister, you put a lid on it, then you can turn on the lights. Well, what they gave me was aerial reconnaissance film. It's the film that they would send up in the satellites, and that means that the emulsion is stripped off of the backing, and it's like, now it's like saran wrap. There's nothing supporting the film. And they gave me a roll of that. I had never, I didn't even know that film existed. I'd never felt it before. I'm in a dark room. What they didn't know was that I, I perform um, really, really well under pressure. It's one of the things I discovered. And I'm in there thinking, I don't know what this is. But it has to be able to go on this reel. And I'm not coming out till it's on the reel. 
So I might have taken an extra five minutes, but I came out and I said, so, you know, what's next? And they, lo they looked at it. N none of them had ever even considered trying to put that on a reel. And they didn't think that you could, but, you know, I did, so. Well, that's a wonderfully satisfying moment for the reader, I can assure you. It, it, it was, but I didn't know until just a little later how, hard, how impossible it was to do what I had done. Yeah. That was fine. Yeah. That was fine. And so let's talk about the transition from uh, working in photography, which involves both developing film and, uh, and as I said, training the people who are going to be using the pens and the buttons and the things like that, to disguise and, and how it came about that you made the transition to working in disguise and, uh, and, and just what that was like. What are your favorite anecdotes from that part of your career? Uh, yeah. The, uh, the disguise thing came out of the blue. I, I hadn't set out to be a disguise officer at all, but I, um, I, I kept saying in the book how the, we were trained and trained and trained, that we were just endless training. And um, I was chosen for this very elite course. There were eight of us in this 1,000-person office. One year of training in, in this course that lasted a year. And they taught you a little bit of everything all the different disciplines that we represented, they taught you how to do it, how to make a wood block, how to, how to make an audio device, how to, how, to, how to handle encrypted communications, how to, how to send it, how to receive it, how to break it out. Morse code, don't ever do that when you're driving down the GW Parkway because you can have a wreck. <laughs> <laughs> beep, 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 beep. And, and you have a wreck. Um, I sound like Trump. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. Uh, they taught us everything. Enough to handle everyday problems. And, and, and uh, assuming you had the common sense when it was too big for you, when you couldn't handle it, to call for help. That was the goal. And so when you're done, you're kind of like a one-man band. Um, some station comes in and says, we need help. Send, send us a technical officer, and they'd send you. And you could, you could do a little bit of audio, you could do a little bit of photo, you could do some secret writing, make a micro dot and go home. Uh, and because of that, that was, that was a really important thing that I did because that just broadened my, my versatility mm -hmm. uh, enormously. Um, be because of that, it, um, it just opened up a, a lot of opportunities. Go back to your question. Well, the question was the, the segue, the move into disguise and what that was like. Uh, and yeah. So because, because of that training, I ended up going out to, and this is so irritating that I can't say countries. You know, yeah. I could dance around yeah. it. I could actually say it without saying it, but I'm not even going to do that. Yeah. I went out to the subcontinent, and I spent a summer filling in for somebody. She, she was gone, and I was, uh, I was there, and I fell in love with that place. I, I, everything, there wasn't anything about it I didn't like, and I decided that I wanted an assignment there. So I came back to talk to my career management officer and tell him that. He happened to be the same guy that was wearing the mask sitting on the sofa. It was my future husband, <laughs> Tony Mendez. I always said to him later, had I known that we were gonna get married, I would have been so much nicer to you. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, you know, I, I, my next assignment, I'd like to take my photo capabilities and go to the subcontinent. He said, there's no job for you there. There's no photo job gonna open up for the next three years. The only thing opening up is a disguise job. And I said, so train me to be a disguise officer. And I did a, just a, it wasn't an about face, but it was a hard right turn in the middle of my career and became a beginner learning everything you need to learn about disguise so that I could have that assignment. So you must be saying to yourself, what could it be? It's what, wigs and mustaches and glasses? Is that disguise? It, 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 it's 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 endless, and it's very, very interesting. It was a, it was a profession that um, I was so glad I ended up doing that work. Like, like, uh, like you were saying at the beginning, it, it, became a, uh, it became a form of body armor when the CIA started working against narcotics, against the cartels, when we started working against terrorism. Uh, half of them, more than half of them being armed, not looking like a gringo when you're in... Um, Bolivia, or not, not looking like a, an American when you're uh, on the other side of the world, could save your life in a lot of in a lot of instances. So it was it was uh, work worth doing, 
and uh, work that I was really happy to do. And it was very creative. Well, was it wigs and glasses and, and could, what else? Could well, be, <laughs> but if you think about it, you, you would understand the, the, the conundrum. Uh, the case officers were all men because they weren't hiring women to do that work. So I'm, I'm, I'm disguising men. So how many, how many men in this, in this room would want to put on a wig and wear it in public? Show of hands. <laughs> See? My job. Whereas a woman would be like, ooh, let's see what I look <laughs> yeah, like. Yeah, do you have a red one? Do you have a blonde one? Right? Uh, the, yeah. women, the women, had they been there, they would have loved it. Uh, so so we, we had to uh, work with the men and convince them that there were scenarios and situations where the wig could save their life, uh, where it could be a really important thing. They wanted to have it. And, and to drive that home, they'd come into our labs. We'd, we'd fit them. We'd, we'd cut things. We'd, we'd, we'd get all the pieces of their disguise they come in for a final fitting. We put it all on. We'd say, so what do you think? You like it? Yeah, all, what, yeah they all liked it. You, so if, if you need to, you're going to wear it? Oh, yes, they, they, would, they would definitely wear it. We'd say, great, go to lunch in the cafeteria and come back and tell us what happens. So they go tiptoeing out in the hall in their disguise, paranoid, just like children. And they'd come back from lunch saying, you know, my boss was there, the guys I work with. They were two tables over. And they discover that nobody sees your disguise if it's well done. Nobody knows you have on a disguise. And nobody knows it's you. That's the important thing. Um, so that was the beginning. But we were trying to get away from wigs and glasses. And, and, and that's what was taking us into masks. Masks are a whole, whole different, uh, different thing. I made a really good man, don't you think? <laughs> that's I incredible. Yeah. I, I used that on the streets of, of D.C. Uh, the FBI sent their G's, that's their surveillance team, after Tony and I. We were in the Four Seasons in Georgetown. We were in the lobby, and then I kissed him on the cheek, and he went left, and I went right. Who do you think the FBI followed? They followed Tony. They followed the guy. They thought he had the football, but I had the football. Anyway, poor G's, they got embarrassed. That was, that was on national TV. That was a PBS show that we did. Um, I, I turned into an old man, and... Um, and I had drinks with the FBI later wearing the old man costume. They were really embarrassed. <laughs> and we and you had a great moment with the president. Oh, yeah, yeah, let's, let's go to that. Uh, we're going to talk about masks. The idea of a mask, uh, an animated mask, that means a mask that will, will actually move with, with your facial muscles. I wore that into the Oval Office with um, the head of CIA. Uh, that's George H.W. Bush, who was the president. Judge Webster next to me, is uh, he was head of CIA. On the left is Brent Scowcroft. It was the morning meeting at the, C at, at the president's office, in the Oval Office. And I told him I'd brought a new disguise uh, for him to admire. He had been the head of CIA before. We had done disguises for him. I said, this is what I have today is so much better than what we gave you. And he's like, well, what have you got? And where is it? Because he's looking. There's no bags around me. I said, I'm wearing it. And, and here, let me take it off and show it to you. And he said, no, 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 wait. Don't take it off. And he got up and he came out and he looked. And he's, he doesn't know what he's looking for. Maybe he thought he's, I had on a fake nose. I don't know. He sat down and he said, okay. So I took it off. The Tom Cruise peel. <laughs> before Tom Cruise. Um, he liked it very much. Everybody was really happy. That was, that was the new program that we'd been working on in disguise. Very expensive. We needed support. We needed political support to start doing some production of these things, and we got it that day. Um, the photographer who took this picture came out after me. I'm out with, with Millie, the dog, and her puppies. And uh, she came out, and she was standing behind me, and she said, excuse me, what was that? And I said, oh, I, you, you photographed it. I heard, I heard the shutter in your camera. You were taking pictures, right? She said, yeah, I got some photos. But she said, but what, what did you do? Because people don't really believe when you're taking off your face. They just don't. <laughs> they've, they, they've been educated somewhere that that, that, isn't, that doesn't make sense. So um, she said, what did you do? And I said, I can't tell you because it's classified. And I think I ticked her off because it took 10 years to get the photo. She didn't send me this one. The one she sent me, they had airbrushed the mask out of my hand, like it's still classified. And so, but whoever did it was 
clever and they left like a finger in. They took what was my face and turned it into a finger. So now the picture reads like I'm, I'm lecturing like, and furthermore, sir. Um, so that was hanging for years in my library on, on the wall. And people, my friends, would say, hmm, hmm, what were you saying to him? <laughs> and I would say, it's classified. <laughs> Can't talk about it. This was toward the end of, of my career. Tony and I, um, I, I got divorced. Tony and I got married. We walked away from the CIA. And the joke is on us because that thing about being an insider and then being, now we're outsiders. And all of our friends are inside. Our old friends, we've lost them years ago. Mm -hmm. We don't know where they are. So now we're like the odd men out. And, um, but we had a secret, a secret thing going where we had big art shows twice a year. And our old friends from CIA would come to our art shows so we could still, you know, maintain those friendships a little bit. So I want to open it up for questions, and while, uh, if you all could come to the microphones, that would be uh, ideal. And, uh, and while people are getting up to come to the microphones, hopefully I'll just ask one question. Uh, if, you can, if you can reveal this, do you have a favorite disguise that you uh, developed or a favorite situation where someone wore a disguise and it was particularly uh, important? You know, there's a, a, a great book available in the bookstore down here called The Billion Dollar Spy by Hoffman. Mm -hmm. And there's a story at the beginning of uh, a CIA case officer in Moscow going to meet one of the most important assets we ever had. A man that was difficult to get to. It was dangerous to meet with him, but, but we had to talk to him. And the only way they could do it was by using a device called a jack-in-the-box, uh, a jib. And we, did, we made that in conjunction with the magic builders out in LA. It was a, it was a pop-up dummy. And on that particular evening, for that particular scenario, we put it in a birthday cake. So you had two wives in the back of the car, two officers in the front. And uh, uh, they took a right turn. The jib, you had to use it just so. You, had, you needed a right turn. And in that right turn, the passenger in the right seat got out. The one that, meet, one that needed to meet our asset they popped up the jib. They're driving down the street now. The surveillance car comes around behind them and still sees the silhouette of two men in the front seat of that car. And they followed them all night. They went here, they went there. And uh, our, our, our officer was able to meet with the Russian asset. And it was a really important meeting. So th just one of those. I mean, it happened a lot, but every time it happened, we didn't hear every time it happened. We didn't know every time there was a success. We didn't need to know that need to know thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a great story. Thank you. Are, are there questions from the audience? Is, is, oh, good. Yeah. That would be Leslie. <laughs> hi, Donna. Hi, Leslie. Where you been? Um, how you been? <laughs> so I was wondering, to the extent that you're able, will you play ball with me for YouTube? <laughs> okay. So... On a YouTube video that I watched of you, you said that at CIA you were a real hard ass. I was wondering if there, what's the funniest thing you ever did to your staff mm -hmm. as opposed to the thing that they did to you? Oh gosh. The thing that comes to mind is when I told them I was going to marry Tony Mendez and they, <laughs> they just all went crazy. They really did. They sat down on the floor. Uh, no one can believe that. It's, it's probably not what you're looking for, but that's, exactly what I'm looking for. That's, great. that's the one that comes to mind, yeah. Go ahead. Two really quick ones. One, I want to ask you about compartmentalization between you and Tony, if there ever was any issue between the two. And second, I want to ask you about attitude. Attitude is part of disguise. It wasn't just the mask. It wasn't just the fake mustache. How much did you have to teach attitude? Did you have to talk about it as a, almost like an acting experience versus just the glasses or whatever else you put on? Those are two really good questions, Vince. Um, compartmentalization with me and Tony. The only time that I remember that he told me an operational story that, that, that I didn't know, he never told me about Argo. 
I didn't know about Argo for years. I was, I was overseas when Argo happened. I knew Tony very well. He never ever mentioned that operation to me. Um, the one he mentioned, I was, uh, I was on the subcontinent. This was that, with, that, with that boss that was gonna set me up for failure. The story is in a book called Spy Dust where we went into a foreign compound and we, we, it was a smoking bolt operation. We took a piece of machinery and I was dancing all around what it was in the book but it was uh, some sort of a communication device that you find in, a, in, a, in an embassy that the, the enemy would really want to grab it, and we grabbed it, and we took it, and we stole it. It was a huge operation. It was just huge. And then I came back, and I was sitting with uh, Tony and some other people. He sent the other people away. He said, tell me about that operation. He's my boss now. He, he's my boss in this conversation. Tell me about the operation. I said, well, I can't tell you about it because you're not on the list. I'm telling my boss that I can't divulge the operation. And he said, <clears throat> how about I tell you about the operation that you just did? And it turns into one of those, those the smoke and mirrors things. What you think you were doing and the reason you think they sent you to do that, it's all bogus. It's none of that. There's a man on the other side of the world who is, there's so much pressure now, they think he works for us and they're getting ready maybe to arrest him and, and, and worse. But by stealing that machine, you are broadcasting to them that you desperately need that machine. And if he's working for us, you don't need that machine. So you're, you're buying him protection and they're backing off of him. That's why you stole the damn machine. And I thought I, thought I was gonna get a medal or something for stealing that machine. <laughs> but I mean, that's the only time he, he kind of broke confidence. We didn't, we didn't, uh, we didn't, talk about operations. We talked about Moscow a lot because we were, we were active. We were, you know, what about this? What about that? But we were doing that kind of together. What was the other, the other question? Attitude. Attitude is everything. With disguise, it's everything. It, you, can, you, can, you can hand, um, um, I did once, a man of just rudimentary, a, a stick, and say, this is a cane, and, you know, it's method acting. You go out there and, and, and inhabit this disguise and believe it, and people will believe it, too. You can also take the most sophisticated disguise that we can make and put it on someone who was timid, who was nervous, who was, uh, their body language was just begging to be noticed and the disguise wouldn't save them. S that was part of sending people down to the cafeteria, wear this thing in public. Uh, it was also part of when we send them overseas, this, this one in particular, um, I said, to, I said to him, I started doing it to a lot of them, just create a character in your head because it'll be the same disguise you use over and over. Make, build this man in your head. He's European, he wears these glasses, he wears horrible shirts that his mother probably buys for him. These shirts that you hate, put them on, wear a gold chain. A man that wears a gold chain like that and has too much cologne, it's like women just like retreat. You know, uh, wear a ring and then take it off and have that line like, like a man who's pretending he's not married. All this stuff, find, find your place in there and then just wear that and become that person. It's a big deal. Yeah, good question. That's great. So I had two questions. Uh, what I was curious about is the first one. You'd mentioned the beer, you'd mentioned the wine. I was curious, was there sort of a limit to how much you could imbibe in public in case an agent lost control and divulged something? And then the second question, I'll just say it now and I'll go back, uh, was I'm intrigued by that personality building. There's a physical aspect of disguise, but creating that psychological, that personality that you then scaffold and build upon, could you speak a little bit to that as well? Um, the wine and the beer, that's just, that was just being in Germany, that was, that was the culture, that's what people did. Because I think the Germans started drinking when they were five, <laughs> they, they, didn't, they didn't seem to over imbibe, but most of the time, neither did we, you would go to wine tastings and things, uh, that sort of thing, you wouldn't, you wouldn't just sit around and, 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 and drink too much. Um, the second question was? Building the psychological personality of disguise. Yeah, you, you had, I don't know if you watched the Americans TV show. Um, Weisberg, Joe Weisberg, who worked for the CIA, was responsible for that show and, and put some interesting pieces in it. So the, the wife, Carrie, what's her name, Carrie Washington? Mm. Russell. Carrie Russell. Yeah. Was constantly in disguise, and she always looked like Carrie with a different colored wig. 
Mm-hmm. And and she, you, you just there was never any question that it was still Carrie. And I always thought that was so dumb. Huh. But in the show, she's married her husband, who's a very good-looking young man. His disguises, when he put them on, he became this mousy little gray man with terrible kind of hair. He didn't care that he looked awful. He was just, and he would be knocking on this door saying, hello, Martha. And do you remember this character? Mm-hmm. He, he, was, he wasn't just wearing his disguise. He was becoming that guy. And that's what we would, we would encourage people to do and, and try to get people to do. But it's hard because if you don't wear a disguise very often, every, every time you put one on, you, you feel a little paranoid. I wore one in Georgetown once. I was an African-American woman. I looked so good. <laughs> Red stiletto, stilettos, black stockings. I had on gloves. I was kind of pretty. I had on a great outfit. Um, I got stuck outside in the rain. It was pouring. And then I couldn't, I, I started out inside a store and I thought they were looking at me, but that's just paranoia when you wear a disguise. You, you always think, oh, they can tell, they can see it. So I stepped outside and it was raining. Because it was raining, the heat was building up and it was coming out of the mask, the eye holes, and it was fogging my glasses and I couldn't see. So I couldn't go in and I couldn't stay outside and it just all came apart. We hadn't planned on what the weather can do to the disguise. Anyway, it's not maybe not the best answer, but that's an answer. What else do we have? Hey. Um, so I noticed you spoke very highly of how much fun your first husband was. Mm-hmm. And so many great things beside him not dancing. Mm-hmm. He seemed to be a real catch. What made you two separate, and what was the time difference between the marriages? As you mentioned, you like to move fast. You were taking notes, sir. (laughs) You know, I talked to someone uh, tonight before the event, and I said, I said there was nothing wrong with him. He was just, um, there's nothing wrong with him. He just wasn't the right one. I think we got married very young, and we got married overseas. We didn't grow up in the same uh, kind of community. Uh, He was more European. I was more American. He didn't dance. He was crazy for rock and roll music. I'm not so interested in rock and roll music. When we got home, he's a football guy. So uh, there's a huge part of the year that he was just gone watching sports. There was none of that TV. There was none of that, not those sports. There was soccer and stuff. But, but we just diverged when we got back to the States. What, what I wanted to do and liked to do, what he wanted to do and liked to do. And then he was in a separate part of the CIA. He was in security, which is a whole different community of people, the people that, that do that work. I was in operations. And so even like office parties, I thought his people were boring. <laughs> and he thought my people were boring. And it just, you know, it just pulls you apart. Um, it just happens. And then you kind of float along because it's not the end of the world. It's not, it's not horrible. Nobody's being mean to the other person. It's just probably not what you want a, a marriage to be. But, but it was the CIA that we both loved so much basically uh, was kind of what split us apart when we, when we got back here in the States. It just wasn't making any sense. So, so we'll take one more question. So I just want to preface this by saying, you know, I think being in the CIA, that's extremely cool. That's extremely cool, being an agent and everything. But with, in recent years, maybe with some operations becoming declassified, stuff like MK Ultra or maybe destabilizing certain s- Central American countries that, and maybe more criticism of the CIA being noted, what is your kind of response to those controversies? Good question. We were MK Ultra. MK Ultra came out of my office. Um, it was kind of a, a terrible experiment that, that went wrong. And I think the CIA has, has owned up to that. that. Back at that time, we thought that the, the Russians were, um, were using drugs and were using all kinds of psychotherapy were, were, were with their people, and we were afraid to get caught flat-footed, so we experimented with things like LSD. And it was before... It was really before I think people understood some of the consequences of some of those experiments. 
And there was one experiment that went terribly wrong. There was a, a man that had problems down here in Washington, D.C., and uh, they took him up to New York. Um, they were talking to doctors in New York. There was a case officer with him. They were in a hotel. That man fell or jumped to his death. He was taking LSD. And uh, his family, I believe to this day, is still, will never believe that we didn't somehow push him out a window. Uh, that, that's, that just goes on and on. That was kind of coming out of Frederick. The family is up in the Frederick area. Um, you want to say it was good faith? It, it, was, uh, it, it might have been good faith, but it was poor scientific practice to, to use those kinds of drugs with, uh, with, to experiment with human beings, even, even witting human beings. We, we, weren't, we weren't giving people that didn't know. But, you know, you see some of these stories that come out of Johns Hopkins, some of the medical... Uh, experiments or, or, or scenarios that arose at Johns Hopkins where they're, they're paying retribution to African-American families, to all kinds of families for, for uh, things that were done. It was wrong. It was wrong. And I think that the CIA has, has admitted that. That doesn't really change anything, does it? It shouldn't, it shouldn't have happened. Um, I think we didn't want to get caught flat-footed back then and... Uh, but that, that was in our office. That piece of our office, we had, um, there was a refrigerator uh, down in one of, the, one of the tunnels in the basement that connected two buildings. And in my, in my knowledge, that refrigerator w was never opened. But had somebody opened it, it was full of cobra venom, vials of cobra venom that had been ordered to be destroyed years earlier when a lot of governments there was some agreement and everybody got rid of those kinds of toxins. They just got rid of them. But we had a, one of our uh, scientists, I remember his name, it, it cost so much to extract venom from cobras that he could not bring himself to destroy it. Wow. So it sat in that refrigerator probably for 30 years. I used to say whoever makes that refrigerator, if they're still in business, they can make the most fabulous ad <laughs> it'll never stop working you know just plug it in and just keep walking by it it'll never it'll never stop working what about your mother you remember your yeah mother? I was just gonna I was just gonna achieve thank you thank you so much you're not a plant but I was gonna achieve closure on that I just wanted to say that one of the things that really stuck out to me in in our conversations uh, and, and in your book is that, um, that your mom, when you were growing up, was employed, if I'm correct, by Lockheed, right? Boeing. By Boeing, sorry, sorry. Uh, and that, uh, that whenever um, there was a furlough or, uh, or business sort of dried up, that it was always your mom who got furloughed. And so you had grown up witnessing this uh, about women in the workplace that and, and that that was similar with contract wives at the agency when you were starting out yeah that the woman always when you would move to a new posting her her uh salary never she'd start over yeah yeah and so when you were getting started this was sort of the norm for you and so as reading your story and, and listening to you talk about your story you helped change that culture you know, you, you may so. or may not acknowledge it, but you <laughs> transformed the culture where women had to accept this, uh, this idea of being furloughed or being the trailing spouse or just never um, being sort of like the red queen and you're always sort of running backwards and, uh, or, or not, not moving forward. And you, um, I, I hope you do own to that I having do. transformed the culture. I had always thought that the culture would change when, when, a, when a fresh generation of young men came into the agency who had been brought up under different circumstances and they'd been educated about this misogyny thing and they, they were going to be more sensitive. And I was always waiting for those men to show up. I really was. <laughs> it never occurred to me that it was the young women who were going to make it stop, who were just going to just not put up with it anymore. And there was, there was a, a scene in the in, in the hallways, going to lunch, big hallway full of people. And uh, this, this one of our guys is walking toward Trish and me. And I said, just don't listen to him because he was like a construction worker in New York. When he saw you at a distance, he'd just start talking to you as he walked toward you. You beautiful, you gorgeous piece of... 
that's how he talked. And, and I'm, I'm worried about this new young chemist that I'm walking with. And I thought, oh, I'm so embarrassed for her. And she just looked at him as he approached. And she said, what's his name? Bill. She says, Bill. Bill. She said, fuck off. <laughs> And, and Bill, I think, I think that was the end of Bill. <laughs> That's great. Thank you.